try to do is pick off where Eric left off and try to um, tie the work that the students have done and with Rich's support um, on developing this project, image processing algorithm, and then some, some new exciting data about how to quantify fat content in cells, but also give you some background as to why this problem is important and also give an overview of what my lab does, if I can get this thing to work. So it's sort of a mouthful of a title. Um, I apologize for that. But so I'll just actually skip, and hopefully, as I move through the talk, what these words mean will become more obvious to you if you're not already familiar with these words. So, um, so, so quick overview of what my lab does. We study cell metabolism. Um, the way I just like to characterize this, we look at what uh, cells take in as raw material, like sugar. It's supposed to be glucose, and it's sort of a closed ring form. Uh, and then cell reactions to make building blocks, um, energy like ATP. And the building blocks include uh, both uh, storage structure as well as inflammation. So this is nucleic acid, it's supposed to be a section of um, DNA. So the cells use these reactions, biochemical reactions, inside to make things it needs to grow and survive and pass on information to the next generation. Um, sort of a more detailed view of what we do in terms of examples. So we do some tool development. I'm working with actually um, collaborators in computer science and electrical engineering. Um, we also develop experimental systems, so in vitro organ systems, cell culture systems, to look at more detail and controlled fashion what these cells do, and then apply these to various uh, applications in metabolic engineering, whether to make stuff like biofuels, some interesting biological polymers like chitosan and um, chitin copolymers, also develop more optimized cell culture systems so we can improve biologics production as these things become more and more important as the drug industry is facing the patent cliff, the small molecules. But really the primary interest of the lab has been, and probably will remain so for the time being, what goes in terms of analyzing in terms of mechanisms, what goes on in disease processes, especially those that involve cell metabolism. A lot of the things that the human body does involves cellular reactions like these, which are fairly complicated. But what's so exciting about this as engineers is the complexity where we want to take these systems of reactions, try to not reduce them to something simple and easily digestible one piece at a time, because that's not how these things work. They work in concert as complex systems. But I think that's what's exciting for engineers to work in these areas, because we have some training to deal with these complicated systems. And, um, and it's also sort of exciting for us. But before I go on, I want to use the opportunity to give some shout outs to graduate students, not way really to motivate them. I was told this is helpful. So I hope it's helpful. Um, I see Julie in the audience. So Julie and Joanne actually were supported by the um, uh, Wittich Foundation grant. We got to make biofuels using E. coli. And what's exciting about this work is that I think we're the first group to actually demonstrate to produce fully um, neutral lipids, oils, in these cells. So you'll see the three theme. A lot of my work involves fat and oils and, and cells. So this is an example where we're trying to make more fat. As I see, as you see my rest of my talk, we're going to try to also make less fat in these cells. So in an E. coli, where we want to make a product, it's a good try to have engineer the cell to make more of something that's not normally present. Um, another application I have, um, this was done with Pfizer, is to try to model and predict the um, fat batch dynamic behavior of um, cell culture processes for biologics production. I'm not allowed to give you units due to my agreement with Pfizer. Um, but suffice it to say that we can actually track the um, cell growth and the antibody titer fairly well over a 14-day culture period, which was sort of a fairly robust achievement for the time we had it done. It's been already cited many times by industry, which is very rewarding. So it's not just staying in the ivory tower of academia. Um, but the rest of my talk, I'm going to give you two quick stories about uh, the disease-related um, research we do. One's on obesity, um, and really was driven by my first graduate student. He actually is, uh, uh, has a degree in biology, even though he did his primary training in my lab. Again, give you sort of uh, the example of Tufts and its uh, collaborative nature. Um, he was a biology student looking for an like, engineering-ish project. And he did a rotation through my lab, liked what he was doing. And so he stayed. And it was great because he had all this biological training. So I didn't have to train him in the biological methods. He could really think about the systems issues and actually plow through something fairly unique and challenging. Um, so you know, if some of you have seen the slides before, I just want to kind of move through it quickly just to show you. The red color is bad. Um, the blue color is good. And as you'll see, we're, as a country, we're getting increasingly more and more obese. And the way people quantify these things is, is by basically a ratio of height to, to weight. Um, not because it's really accurate, but because it's cheap and easily um, executed at, you know, across the country. But the bottom line is, even a couple years ago, 
Um, if you sort of take into account obesity, heart disease, diabetes, everything that goes with it, that's about 15, no, 16% of total U.S. healthcare costs per year. So it's quite a bit. So if you can make a small dent in, in the obesity problem, certainly I think you can make also substantial contribution to society, of course, uh, human health as well. Um, so, you know, it's fairly easy to say, and probably it's right, that a lot of the problem is due to uh, lifestyle changes. We're more sedentary as a population. But on the other hand, the rate of incidence of obesity increase cannot be really attribu attributed to only the exercise factor or genetic mutations of the population, because those things are pretty stable. What really has changed, and this is, I think, actually consistent with what Eric was working on in terms of groundwater contamination, there's a pretty strong correlation with the use of um, organic pollutants and our exposure to those things, like pharmaceutical products, uh, personal health care products. Um, and there's a pretty robust correlation between the increase of that and findings in the environment that are immediate to a human experience, like drinking water, for example. I have a bottle, which probably has some BPA in it, but it's a plasticizer. And it turns out those chemicals have been increasingly looked at as potential obesogens, or chemicals that cause obesity. So um, there may be some correlation there. The other sort of new exciting thing, sort of hot thing in biology these days, is the interaction between microbes in your body, the, the human microbiome, um, and these chemicals, and obesity. So if you sort of put these things to, together, um, the recognition that we have microbes in the body that can metabolize, perhaps synthesize new chemicals from these raw materials, which are these organic pollutants, you have a sort of new model of interaction between the environment and the human body that involves the gut, these chemicals, and the adipose tissue. So um, at the cellular level, how we gain weight is, and I think the students will talk a bit more about this later on, we have a reservoir of some stem cells, uh, although I should be careful to call them stem cells in case there are any biologists in the audience. Um, they're really progenitor cells that can become fat cells and pretty much nothing else. So they commit to becoming pre adipocytes, and these cells can still proliferate and divide methodically to grow in number. Um, and then once they commit to differentiating into sort of new young fat cells, these are nice healthy fat cells that can actually respond to insulin and, and store glucose and protect the body from hypoglycemia. But these cells can no longer divide, but they can still grow in volume by a factor of maybe um, a thousand or so in terms of volume size, because you know dimensions and, and volume scale to the third power. Um, so the, the couple of processes that you have increase in cell number and increase in cell size as these things, uh, processes move through, and there's some speculation that these big cells could actually trigger the recruitment and proliferation of new reservoirs of adult stem cells to become fat cells, so you have this vicious cycle going on where you have larger fat cells stimulating production of new fat cells. So that's sort of nutshell what goes on, and what really happens at the so whole body level, and why this is bad for you. So let's say if you had too many bags of potato chips, um, chocolate chip cookies, generally high fat, high sugar, um, it's thought to be bad for you. And the idea is that these kind of nutrients make these normal looking adult fat cells into really large, ugly looking, big hypertrophic cells. And it is thought that these cells can cause inflammation. And really, it's the inflammation, and you can fill in your, you know, um, whatever expletive you want to put in, but really, it's the inflammation that's bad for you. So if all the molecular evidence is out there that sort of try to correlate obesity to the health outcomes that are detrimental, like diabetes, type 2 diabetes, um, hypertension, um, strokes even, um, they all seem to sort of center around the idea that tissues for here and other tissues in the body become inflamed. And these are not fever-inducing inflammations. These are chronic, low-grade inflammations that cause um, the he negative health outcomes. So with a sort of long-winded introduction, but I want to get everyone a little somewhat up to speed on biology. Um, going back to the cell metabolism idea and the complex pathways involved, what we want to do then is look at how these cells then store and accumulate so much fat. Why don't they just burn it away? Why don't they reject it? Is there some control mechanism in place? Much like a chemical process flow sheet. So we have these flow sheets about cell processes in terms of carbon reactions as well as control processes, which are the dotted lines. And what we want to do is take a look at this in its own complexity as an integrated system. So as a chemical engineer, one of the first things we do is look at mass balances. So we can keep track of these chemicals that go in and out of the cell. We can't keep track of everything because there are tens of thousands of chemicals, but we can certainly keep track of things that are the main carbon nutrients and the products, byproduct of metabolism. So that's what we've done. And so here's some sort of uh, face contrast images of those fat cells that Eric was talking about earlier. These are these progenitor cells, and then as they induce the differentiate in culture, they become bigger and bigger and bigger until you see these big spherical objects. Basically, let's imagine if you oil droplets in water, you try to minimize surface tensions, so it becomes spherical. 
which is sort of, you know, thermodynamic consequence. Um, I'm oversimplifying probably, but uh, that's sort of generally what happens. And then we can keep track of these uh, rates of accumulation and excretion of different carbon substances out of the, in and out of the cell. One of the first things that jumped out at us is that it's not a monotonic trend. Some things go up, some things go down. So not everything is the same way. So I actually literally pulled this slide from my first lecture of my class that I used to teach in reactive design. So these are my actual own lecture slides. And what we do is we try to take in and do a mass balance of what comes in and what goes out. And at steady state, the accumulation term should drop to zero. And we can figure out the distribution of these reaction rates by doing simple mass balances. So if you know all the reactions or the bulk of the reactions, we can keep track of what's coming in. And let's say we observe a distribution like this, where A comes in at a certain rate, and there's a more of a production of B than C, then we can guess fairly robustly that the distribution should favor the formation of B. And the, kind of, the nice thing about this kind of analysis is that it doesn't disrupt the cell. We can collect measurements in and out of the cell without killing the cell and opening up. So we can do dynamic measurements over time and collect example snapshots of steady states over time. Gives an idea of how the cells behave. So that's what we've done. So the first thing we've done is look at a fat cell as it grows naturally and gets bigger to what happens to these chemical reaction rates. This sort of a simplified schematic map, um, vastly reduced from the more complex uh, system I showed you earlier. And you can see that uh, the numbers go up and down. Uh, so the green ones means they go up relative to the initial time point, And then red ones means they go down relative to the initial time point. And we immediately noticed that looking at the map, something interesting is going on here because you have things that are going up in one direction, yet another key reaction that's attached to this particular node that's going up and down. So that's actually pyruvate, a key organic acid within the cell. And we had some chemicals that could buy from sigma Aldrich they could be used to inhibit these reaction rates. So we have done that. And if you actually inhibit those reactions, turns out all the numbers turn red, which was dramatic. It's not just localized to this issue, this particular node here at all. It was spread throughout the whole cell, which again supports the idea this is a system. It's integrated. It's regulated as a whole. And what the key finding was that this actually reduced the total lipid um, accumulation rate within the cell essentially by suppressing de novo fatty acid synthesis, but also not inhibiting glycerol uh, release as well as glucose uptake, um, so which was very encouraging because we didn't want to produce, produce a cell that would not take in any more sugar because that's a primary function of the fat cell. Um, we've done also done similar experiments using um, biological proteins that can uncouple for respiration. This was sort of my naive idea, the first project we tried actually, where we thought we could just burn away the cell. And we tried and tried and tried and failed because um, it just doesn't work that way. Um, after the fact, we realized that the cell actually evolved not to oxidize fat. Um, it wouldn't make any sense for the fat cell. Its primary function is to store lipids within its own body. So the rest is not exposed to those lipids to start oxidizing it. Um, so evolutionally speaking, it's actually very tricky to try to get the fat cell to burn fat, which is actually what we found. So we just we discovered old knowledge. But what the interesting thing was, um, when we uncouple respiration, we still reduce the fat storage, not by oxidizing it through the TCA cycle and, and respiratory pathways, but by actually doing the same thing we saw with the chemical inhibitors. What the cell actually ended up doing was to respond by a constant pressure to reduce, to actually increase oxidation. When we decoupled respiration, the cell sensed that respiration was no longer efficient and just decided to actually um, upregulate glycolysis, which is a much less efficient way to metabolize energy. Um, you know, if you sort of, for those of you who are taking biochemistry and biology, um, the ATP generated per glucose molecule through glycolysis, this upper portion of the long pathway, is a lot less than the uh, metabolic energy output through the respiratory pathways. So what the cells have done is adapt to these less efficient energy conditions and they store less. So what we've done is engineer cells, actually they respond um, by being less efficient, and which is a great thing for a fat cell, because the problem with the fat cells is that they're too efficient by storing energy. We would want to actually, in retrospect, and so this is sort of the idea we have is to encourage inefficient pathways within the cell so they store less and uh, waste energy. Um, we're not oxidizing, so there's no oxidative stress. Uh, they're just still metabolizing glucose. They're just making everything into lactic acid and glycerol. So that's sort of the ongoing direction of this research. And now that we sort of had an idea about the path we want to target, um, we then asked the question, and this is where Eric comes in and the students come in. Can we do this in a high throughput fashion? Doing this by chemical assays, which we can do, takes a lot of time and effort and cost. So if you can do, just look at the cells, 
hit them with different chemicals, a library of chemicals, and see what happens to the lipid droplets, would be a really good way to screen these chemicals effects initially. So I'll let James and Brian talk more about sort of their cool image analysis. I frankly don't understand a lot of it anyway. Um, this is beyond my head. Um, but the, the, the good news for me from the chemical and biological engineering analysis point of view is that the data seems to be actually consistent with our tried and true gold standard of chemical measurements. So we can measure total lipid content after some stimulation. This is the same enzyme we knocked down before, this time with an RNAi molecule to be more specific. And then it turns out the image analysis data, at least so far, seems to bear out the biochemical measurement. So that's very encouraging. Thank you, Eric, Brian, and James. So that's sort of one quick story. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Um, but I also want to do some justice to um, the metabolomics phrase in there. So um, again, acknowledging a student up front. So Zogotham is a 50 grad student. It's been just phenomenal in terms of actually working on this project um, with a collaborator at Texas A&M. Uh, in the sense that this is not his thesis project. It was kind of a side thing I threw on to him. And he kind of took it and ran with it. And has done some amazing work and produced really nice results. So a quick recap in terms of the background. I already mentioned to you that the gut's important. Um, and so a prevailing sort of exciting hypothesis is that um, the gut is a source of inflammation if they metabolize these environmental chemicals. So what our collaborator has actually identified um, is that, uh, whoops, that's got cut off. Um, supposed to show the whole image is that he actually found that certain bacterial metabolites are beneficial. You may have heard of probiotics, um, sort of those live culture yogurts that are good for you. Um, so he actually found that these bacteria uh, that are in your gut can produce metabolites, in this case it's called indole, from an essential amino acid called tryptophan that's actually good for you. It reduces inflammation. So he published in PNAS recently. And then he's got some biochemical data. Then he was doing a sabbatical in my lab maybe a year ago and asked me this question because he knew he had some interest in metabolic pathways. What else could tryptophan, this is a source molecule, make besides indole? This is the good molecule. Um, I said, well, let's look at the map. So, uh, so this is still tryptophan. That's still in the, I'm sort of zoomed out a little bit. So it can make lots of different things. <laughs> um, and the, the green boxes here are actually um, the reactions that the human body possesses. So it could also make in the human body. But the rest, the dominant majority, are the reactions that the bugs can carry out, but humans cannot. Again, still many different routes. This was sort of begging for a graph theory approach, um, as Eric would probably appreciate. So if you keep zooming out, the dot has now probably disappeared. Probably can't really see it. It's somewhere around here, here in the amino acid uh, cluster. You got lots of reactions and lots of compounds that the metabolite could become. And they're all connected somehow, some way. So trying to do this manually by just kind of looking at these images became quickly intractable. So um, we had actually been working with Soha Soon in computer science for some time about using graph tools. And that's saw Mona in the audience. Um, who would develop a really nice algorithm to actually kind of navigate through these maps and do it very systematically, but in an efficient manner. We don't have to do exhaustive, very intractable computing. So we actually had a way to construct these predictive routes of biosynthesis um, from a prior publication. So I just turned it around and said, can we go backwards and see what the idea, the initial application was to see what we can do to make interesting new molecules from a given source of metabolite. Here it's a very related problem. We just use this algorithm to try to predict given a source metabolite, what it could become, and then keep iterating until we hit a target that's already in the host, so we can stop there. And then rather than try to build this tree all at once, where you can see that even one reaction can have many daughter reactions, each of these daughter reactions can have more progeny reactions, so on and so on and so forth, this tree would quickly become very, very large and become intractable. So what uh, Soa and Mona came up with was to actually do this by taking turns. So you do one sample, predict one pathway. Start over again and repeat the process and it turns out, again, for reasons I don't fully understand, but I'm not a computer scientist, um, this is more efficient. And I took the word for it because the uh, computing closed in reasonable time. So when we did that, we were able to rank order the uh, metabolites based on how often these things were picked. So this is a ranking of the related metabolites to tryptophan. And then what we've done and Gotham has done in the lab, I shouldn't say we because it's all Gotham's work, um, he sort of trained himself and sort of studied the art of metabolomics, um, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, and then figure out a way to quantify all these things in samples we got from a collaborator from Texas A&M in, in mouse gut, essentially. So we took some mouse uh, um, 
digestive tract samples, and then try to quantify. And we're able to now actually get quantitative numbers, I think, for the first time. No one else, has, as far as we can tell, has reported this data on these metabolite levels. And the cool thing is that they're biologically active. So uh, these are just you know, related structures of chemicals. We use a cell-based assay. Again, this was developed by um, Professor Jadam's lab at Texas A&M, where basically a green color means that it has some biological activity. In this case, the good news is that these are anti-inflammatory pathways that these chemicals are activating. So not only the source molecule, but the related family of molecules also have some anti-inflammatory activities that we can now predict, quantify, and also then verify using biological assays. So um, I think you know, it gives us a really new, exciting direction to go forward by just combining graph theory, biological assays, some basic chemical engineering, maternal energy balances, and try to come up with a pipeline whereby we can come up with new chemicals that we can predict. They're fairly safe. They're already in your body. Not, these aren't synthetic chemicals. Um, these are endogenous chemicals that the human body has evolved with over time. Um, of course, the chicken and egg question remains, you know, is it that uh, obesity causes some changes in my, uh, microbial cells in the body, or does a change in the microbial cells cause obesity? So um, I'd just like to conclude with a, sort of one thought, sort of my uh, paying respect and, and, and homage to uh, an um, earlier Nobel laureate. Um, this book was recently published. You can buy it from Amazon by Gary Hofnagel. He's a pretty actually prominent guy in, in, in the field. He's at the University of Michigan who's got this book called The Probiotics Revolution. You know, this is the new frontier in terms of better nutrition. Forget the drugs. We're going to eat our way to better health um, with good stuff. So, so I don't know if those of you who recognize him, uh, he kind of looks like Jeff Bridges, but <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I thought when I saw the picture. Um, he's a Russian Nobel laureate. He actually um, discovered um, phagocytosis um, and, and won the Nobel Prize in the early 1900s. He actually came up with the idea of probiotics around the same time. So the idea is more than 100 years old, and we're just taking credit for it again and again and again. But so the vision for the lab then is moving forward. You know, we can start with these dietary nutrients that we eat anyway, like amino acids. Um, use um, in situ predictions of microbial metabolism to predict what new chemicals that could be uh, being made in the body as we speak. Um, and then use, you know, advanced electrochemical chemistry to quantify and validate that really there at certain levels. And then we'll test them for anti-inflammatory activity. And hopefully what we can come up with, um, I was very excited when I come up with the name postbiotic. You know, there's prebiotic, which is the uh, raw ingredients, uh, foodstuffs that encourage the growth of these probiotics. The probiotics are pro-life, so pro-life agents. And then the postbiotic would be the stuff that these cells actually make after they've been probed to uh, make these metabolites. It turns out someone else already copyrighted it and, and trademarked it, so <laughs> a little too late. So if you have any good ideas about naming these things, I'd be more than happy to listen. But the basic idea really is we can start with known metabolites and come up with new metabolites that are already there in your body, and hopefully there'll be some benefit to treating obesity. So I guess I'll just end by thanking lots of people. I highlighted the students uh, and who have worked on the project, uh, both past and present. Um, Brian and Long are actually current seniors in chemical engineering. Long's doing the metabolomics. Brian, while well, you're here soon, is doing the image analysis. So thank you very much.